This video was made possible by our generous supporters on Patreon. Visit our Patreon page and vote for next week's video. What's this war in the heart of nature? Why does nature vie with itself? The land contend with the sea. Is there an avenging power in nature? Not one power, but two? The Thin Red Line is an experience. It's a fascinating look at war that only a visionary director like Terence Malick could have achieved. Unlike, for example, Spielberg's graphic portrayal of war in Saving Private Ryan, which came out a few months before Malick's film, the Thin Red Line offers no clearly defined emotional solutions. It isn't based on pro-American principles and overall wasn't marketable entertainment to general audiences, except for the massive cast. Because of this, The Thin Red Line is better approached as art and as a philosophy lesson than a traditional war film. It's a film that focuses on questions that are perhaps impossible to answer and seeks to examine the very purpose of all war and man's role in nature. The movie opens with a crocodile, a killing machine which is a representation of savage nature, slithering into hiding. This signals the violence and danger that already dwell in nature, regardless whether humans interfere with it or not. But the crocodile also comes into play later. The central question of the movie is presented in the opening. Why does nature vie with itself? The opening minutes of the film follow two soldiers gone AWOL, living in peace with tribal people. Malik implies this is the kind of society that reflects man's best nature. As this theme connects man within nature, Malik rarely mentions the actual battle of Guadalcanal that the movie depicts, nor the goals of the characters as a group, nor the United States in this setting. The basis of the film is found in the existential questions character ask through the form of voiceovers and dialogue, not in historical details of the war. I wondered how it would be when I died. Who are you who live in all these many forms? Why should I be afraid to die? Far away from home, these men create their own meaning to try to make sense of the horrors surrounding them, since they are forced to consider life as they contemplate their own mortality. The philosophical debate at the core of the film is reflected in the opposing ideologies of Private Wit, one of the soldiers gone AWOL, and Sergeant Welsh, played by Sean Penn. Wit is an optimist, and his time with the natives suggests that he learns a truth that is too profound for Welsh to grasp, that humankind and nature can coexist in harmony. That we are as much a part of nature as grass, water, animals, and trees. On the other hand, Welsh's views are as pragmatic as they are cynical, believing mankind is simply moved by forces outside of our control, like economic and political power. Malik continuously exchanges these two points of view in the film, as the battle scenes that are filled with death and suffering sometimes give way to peaceful images of nature, light shining through leaves and lingering images of animals. This stark contrast between the real and the ideal is at the heart of the film. In this world, a man himself is nothing. And there ain't no world but this one. You're on there, Top. I've seen another world. And you've seen things I never will. Wood has asked himself so many questions about existence and he's seen the other side that he can see beyond the limitations Welsh puts in front of him, beyond the limitations of military structure and political power, into a world of ultimate transcendence and balance among nature. During the attack on the last Japanese stronghold on the island, the American operation is a success. However, instead of making the scene feel climactic, Malik transmits a sense of defeat for both parties. 
the war is seen as nothing more than a series of continued atrocities. In the middle of the mayhem, a buried face of a dead Japanese soldier speaks to Wit in a voiceover. Are you righteous? Kind? Are you loved by all? Know that I was, too. Through Wit's eyes, the viewer now recognizes that war brings suffering to both sides and remains a tragedy regardless of borders. Go straight up that goddamn hill! You are captain right now! My company alone cannot take that position, sir! Who's doing this? Who's killed us? Is this darkness in you too? The film's central message of war as a crime against nature is explored several times in the film. The crocodile that's seen in the opening shot is later seen again, but this time as a captive of soldiers. When man proves himself to be the most dangerous predator of all, it's clear that war is a crime against nature more than against humanity itself. Amid the gunfire and explosions during the battle for Hill 210, the focus suddenly shifts to a dying bird, its wings shattered by gunfire. Malik wanted to get the point across that all living beings have the uncontrollable need of killing one another. The Thin Red Line is historically ambiguous and it asks too many questions about reality to possibly answer. But this makes the film a kind of mystical experience, dwelling on the transcendence of the spiritual and the evils of war. The answers to the questions asked by Malik are not important. What's important is that we ask these questions at all. Malik's view of the world where nature exists in balance with mankind is hopeful, but we might never see it. There's an old Midwestern saying, there's only a thin red line between the sane and the mad. The line remains. <laughs>